Uh, good morning. I uh, like coffee with the mayor. And we're in March, and spring is just around the corner. Uh, but that brings storms. So you might know that last week we did have some storms in the Stone area. And I can show you a couple pictures. This is a picture that I took on Saturday, or Sunday morning, I should say, after the storm came through Saturday night. You can see how violent the down uh, straight line winds were. Uh, pulled this big pine tree right out of the ground. And then I have another one. Uh, this one here is over on Milwaukee Street, and you can see the telephone poles that were blown over. And this is the second time that this set of telephone poles have been blown over in the last year. And this one caused quite a few power outages in that area. But I was really pleased with the response time from our crews to get uh, everybody's power up and running. The storm came through around 10 o'clock Saturday night. Uh, my power went off at our house. And usually when that happens, I send out a, a text to our uh, public works director as well as our utilities director to make sure that they know what's going on. In the meantime, um, the phone starts ringing, people start getting on social media, and it was pretty obvious at this point that uh, the majority of the city was without power, and they had already uh, had their teams on the road, some of the... Uh, the uh, employees of those departments um, communicated amongst themselves, so they were already deploying before they even uh, got word from their supervisors, so they were all over it. Um, they called in crews from six other municipalities to help restore the power, and it's pretty, pretty amazing if you think about it, where you have this storm that comes through, you have down power lines, it's dark at night, and then you have people coming in that don't know each other and they have to try to put this all back together to restore power. So we're really grateful for the crews that came in and the fact that nobody was injured um, during these storms. The storms here in Stoughton were declared to be from straight line winds. Um, we had communication with Dane County Emergency Management on Sunday and I, uh, I talked to them and I, I requested a meeting uh, first thing Monday morning. They were able to accommodate that meeting. In that, that meeting, we kind of went through um, the series of events, asked a few questions, and really just tried to understand why the sirens didn't go off. And what we learned is that the National Weather Service, when they issue a uh, storm warning, that automatically triggers the uh, sirens that go off from Dane County Emergency Management. And then if you have an app on your phone or you have a weather radio, uh, those, those devices are also activated. And the word from the National Weather Service was, is as they monitored the storm here on radar, the winds were only about 35 miles per hour. And then just all of a sudden, they spiked up to 80 to 95 miles per hour. And by the time they were able to issue an alert, the, the damage had already been done. So they definitely will be kind of reviewing, you know, their computer modeling and see what they can do on their end um, to see if there's, you know, opportunity for improvement in that area. Dane County does have an override system. They're actually looking at their policies to determine whether or not um, in a situation like this going forward that they, they might uh, override the system for these straight line winds. Other damage occurred in the town of Dunkirk. I toured that site with uh, County Executive Parisi yesterday. There were two farms uh, across the street from each other, family farms. There was significant amount of damage on those uh, buildings. Um, none of the you know animals were killed, some of them were injured, but a lot of the silos and sheds and buildings were tore up pretty good, so we're, we're thankful nobody out there was injured as well. One of the things that we learned on Monday is that when you have a storm like this, you can declare you know emergency um, order, and you can do that if you are anticipating damages um, for a, for more than four dollars and ten cents per capita. So for Stoughton, that's approximately fifty-three thousand dollars. And at the time that we were making a decision whether or not we should declare the emergency we kind of looked at what we knew and tried to anticipate what might be coming and decided to go ahead and declare the emergency 
knowing that if we had to, we could withdraw it later. Um, so we're thankful we did that. Uh, we were able to get the order written. I uh, had help from our staff. We sent it over to emergency management. They said it looked good to them. Um, we had the city council uh, ratify that on Tuesday night. And at this point, we know there's over $200,000 worth of damage in Stoughton alone. So once again, we're grateful that nobody was hurt and that we were able to respond and restore most of the power to residents within 24 hours. There were some residents that could not get power restored because they needed to do work on their homes uh, before we could energize the electricity. So it was quite an ordeal, but we're, we're, we're thankful and we, we hope that we won't have any more the rest of the year. So the other night at City Council, I went through and did a presentation to kind of update the, the City Council and the community on our population. This is the third year in a row that I've done this. And I'll just run through some of these slides. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, here's our map. So the first slide here is the county slide. And you can see from 1970 to 2000, the county grew 136,000 residents, and then it shows our annual growth. And then from 2000, they're projecting to 2030, uh, about the same, maybe a little bit less growth. And you can see the Stoughton numbers underneath. So from 1970 to 2000, we actually grew more than the county. But from 2000 on, we've grown less. And 48% of the growth in Stoughton came in a 22-year period, and that's what this chart illustrates. This one here shows what we call housing starts. So these are building permits that were pulled in Dane County, and it goes all the way back to the year uh, 2000. It's kind of hard to see on here. But back in the early 2000s, you can see, you know, we were pulling between 2,000 and just over 2,500 building permits a year. And then that number dropped significantly during the recession, which is in the middle there. And then it's kind of ramping back up where we're doing about 12 to 1,300 uh, building permits per year. So even though the population in Dane County increased, the number of new homes that were built to accommodate the people that are coming here is about half of what it used to be back in the early 2000s. So therefore, um, we have a housing shortage in Dane County. Here's a map of Stoughton. This one here is uh, a slide taken from our comprehensive plan. Every 10 years we do a comprehensive plan. And at that time we did a survey and we only had 433 people in the whole city respond to the survey which is only 3% of the population. Normally, you'd like to see 10% of the population participate in order to get good data, um, but it is what it is. And at that point, 28% um, of the people said they'd like to have 10% growth in a 10-year period, so 1% a year. So as we, we go through, there's just some information I decided to put in here uh, are demographics. So 95% of the Stoughton population is white and the other 5%, you can see it's broken down here. So we're predominantly white community. Um, and then I also put in some definitions uh, for affordable housing and it's usually determined by your income. And what we found in Stoughton on uh, the affordable housing and they also use what they call a, a average median income that the income level in Stoughton is, uh, is lower than a lot of the communities in Dane County. And our rent is also lower too, but the bottom line is, is proportionately our rent is slightly higher than a lot of the other municipalities that surround us here in Dane County. So affordable housing is something that you'll be hearing a lot of here in the next couple of years as we try to you know, deal with what we consider a housing crisis here in Dane County. This is the Stoughton population. So if you go back uh, to uh, when Stoughton was uh, founded, which is actually 175 years ago, uh, we're celebrating our anniversary this year, there were 70 people in Stoughton. Now we're at 13,078. 
And this chart kind of shows here, you know, what I said before, that most of the growth occurred back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Is that the 2020 census? Yep, yeah, that's based off the 2020 census. And the other start for the individual years were estimates. But that is our official population as of 2020. What is I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, this chart here um, breaks down um, our housing units, and much like Dane County in the early 2000s, we were doing between 40 and 50 single family homes every year. During the recession, we had uh, a few years where we built one new home the whole year. We did that, looks like three years in a row. And then now we've been doing, you know, 15 to 20 a year. We anticipate that number is going to increase dramatically. There's a whole lot of development that's going to be occurring, and I'll show you where here shortly. So what I do is I try to take this information and do some projections. So this slide here is a slide from the National Home Builders. And the next two slides, what they do is they break down based on the type of home. You can have an average of how many people live in each home and how many of those homes provide students. And it's broken down by single family home, multi-unit apartments, and duplexes. So what I do is I take that information and I put this put a formula into my spreadsheet here. And then I can also put in what we know as far as the housing developments that are already approved or in the process of being approved in Stoughton. And then I let the spreadsheet do the math for me. And is it, as you can see right now, our big developments, and I'll show you maps here shortly, are Kettle Park West, which is behind Walmart. They have 207 single family homes that are ready to be built out there. We anticipate any time now that the builder out there, Lanier, who is the largest home builder in the United States, will be pulling building permits. And we had expected them to start earlier, but with the supply chain issues and the labor shortage, they're really having a hard time getting deployed, but they have closed on the land purchase, which means we're getting closer to them to begin pouring foundations out there. If you've driven out there, many of the roads are completed, uh, signs are put up, it's all staked out for the lots, they're ready to go. They just need to get some people out there to start building. Uh, the homes out there, the price points are gonna vary. Um, there's, there's, I think, four different price points out there. You know, when we first talked to them, they were hoping they were going to be 275 and up. I think they're going to be up higher than that now just because of the cost of everything going up. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's going to be really hard to attain that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have done is we created a, a fund of money. There's a, there's a, a law that allows us um, to extend what we call a tax incremental finance district. And if you extend the district once all your debt in that area, that district has been paid off, you can extend that, the life of that district if you use that for affordable housing. So we were able to close a district, we extended it for a year, and we captured an additional $500,000 worth of money. So what we're gonna do is we took half of that money and we're gonna be doing some remodeling at Green Spire. We're gonna fix up four more units there to make it more modern and ADA accessible and user friendly for the residents there. And then the other half of the money, the other 250,000, we have set aside where we can help people with their down payment. Um, so we're hoping that we can get some of the uh, local employers to, to contribute as well. So we want people that live in Stoughton to be able to afford to, to, you know, the people that work here to be able to afford to live here as well because we know that every day 6,000 people that live in Stoughton drive to Madison to work, and we know another 6,000 people come to Stoughton to work, many of them from Rock County because it's more cost effective for them to live in Rock County than it is in Dane County. Mm -hmm. And we see that at our major employers, whether it's uh, Stoughton Trailers, the hospital, the school district, Ortega, Uniroyal, um, any of the assisted livings. We know that a lot of the employees that work there just cannot live 
cannot afford to live in Stoughton. Right. So that's kind of one of our goals is, is to try to come up with some strategies to change that. So as you look at the spreadsheet here, I mentioned Kennel Park West. The other major development we've had going on in the last few years is Nordic Ridge. And one of our uh, uh, local builders here, uh, a gentleman that was born and raised here, worked for the second largest home company out of Virginia. And he has decided that he wants to help Stoughton uh, by starting, coming out of retirement and starting up a building company in the area because he's concerned about enrollment in the school district. I graduated from Stoughton High School and the class back then was much larger than it is now. So he's working with some of the other uh, local people here and they bought the rest of the lots at Nordic Ridge. There was, I think, 47 of them. And they're really aggressive and they're gonna probably build them out much quicker than I have on this chart here. This chart here was just based on average of what we built there every year. We expect that those numbers will at least double until all the lots are gone. So all the lots at Nordic Ridge are purchased and will be built on. The other things that we're working on right now is 51 West, and that's the area out on Stoughton Lumber on the one side, and then by Eggleston's Woods on the other side. So we've been working with two townships, uh, the DOT, the developer, a couple engineers, different lawyers, and we're trying to get all this put together, and um, day by day we get a little bit closer to getting this uh, development started. We're hoping to get going here in the summer yet. When we do that, we're going to have um, apartments on both sides, um, some duplexes, which will be entry level, we call them. So typically, the duplexes don't have basements, so they're user friendly, especially for seniors or people that are disabled. So we're really excited about those opportunities. Building duplexes is a little bit more affordable than a single family home. Uh, it doesn't cost the builders a whole lot more to build them, uh, but they can sell them off and you know and make their money and yet provide some more affordable options. The one section on the west side, uh, we project in 2024, the builder that is doing the apartments applied for, uh, there's a WIDA program, and what WIDA does is they provide tax credits for builders that have uh, affordable workforce housing in their units and it's based on their income. So we anticipate that there'll be, I think it's 73 units, that'll be a workforce housing. And we expect to hear back from WIDA sometime in the middle or late April on whether or not that builder um, was awarded those uh, tax credits. There's two different programs. There's a 4% and there's a 9%. So. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed there. Either way, the apartments will be built, but we prefer to have some workforce to make it more affordable for people because their rent will be based on their income. Um, there's also going to be uh, the uh, riverfront project, which is uh, uh, you know down by the river right now. That was the industrial area that we're redeveloping. We had hoped to be able to start that as soon as next month. There, there is a delay. Um, there's quite a bit of contamination that was down there from the industrial sites over the years. They used to build wagons down there back in the day. Um, there was a mill shop that was down there. And we're working with the DNR and the environmental engineers uh, to put together what they call a material maintenance plan. And we submitted soil samples to the DNR and that plan was almost completed. And then we had to do additional soil samples for the landfill where some of the soil may go to if it's contaminated and during the process of the samples being set to the landfill they discovered another uh, contaminant that wasn't originally identified when we pulled the samples for the DNR and basically the material is a chemical that was used to coat railroad ties and telephone poles back in the 1930s so we're hoping that that, that contamination is isolated to a particular area where we know there was a railroad line down there. And so we have to do some additional testing to determine the area where that contamination might be contained in. Once we get through that testing, uh, we'll have to uh, add that to the material maintenance plan for the DNR and hopefully the project will still begin yet this year. Um, that's just one of them things that happens. We've hired all the best professionals 
to do this work and you know it's not um, you know it's a little frustrating for us but yeah it is part of the process and we'd rather find out now than later if there's contaminants in there so we don't have to shut down the project we're trying to uh, work with the DNR to at least be able to start the first phase so if we can complete the material maintenance plan for phase one and remove those uh, chemicals out of the soil for that, then we can focus on the future phases as we're building the first couple buildings and then uh, update that material maintenance plan for the rest of the site. So when you look at this chart here, and I know it's a little bit hard to read, I can project out population and students. Based on what we have, which I would call in the pipeline currently, we would anticipate uh, possibly having almost 200 students uh, for our school district, which is really important, and I'll show you why in a little while. And it would more than likely increase our population by around 2,400 people. And that's kind of a static thing because obviously what we've seen in the school district is that um, the amount of uh, children that parents are having nowadays have, have been reduced and we have had an aging population here in Stoughton. So this is really just based on the development. It has nothing to do with people that are currently here and how those numbers could change. The next slide is uh, shows our growth. This is what we call our net new construction. So several years ago, uh, the state law was changed. We used to just be able to raise our taxes based on what our needs were in order to provide services in the city of Stoughton and statewide. So back in around 2011, 2013, the state law changed because they felt that property taxes were getting out of control. Um, Stoughton has always been frugal and what happened is, is you were capped at the amount of money you spent at that place in time and everybody was capped. So your overhead was, was capped and what we found in Stoughton, and this is true for the school district, is since we had always been a fiscally conservative, we were capped at a low level or lower level than a lot of the other surrounding communities. They had more staffing, more overhead, so they were actually locked in at a higher level than Stoughton was. So that's really one of the challenges that we've had is as we grow, we need to add staffing. And the only way we can exceed our spending cap is through what they call net new construction. Net new construction is basically the value of the additional homes or buildings or uh, businesses that are built during a calendar year. So you can see um, in Stoughton, our average since 2013 is 1.37%, which is pretty close to the state average, which is 1.41%. But you can see in Dane County, we're at 2.28%. So Stoughton has been slower to develop in, than other municipalities here in Dane County. And I think some of that is proximity, some of that is maybe um, the perception that maybe Stoughton wasn't looking to grow. Um, I know there's been some statements that there were some caps placed on growth, which I don't believe there was actually any official action taken on that. There was always talk about doing that, but I don't think that actually occurred. Um, most of the communities that are growing are closer to the interstate. Uh, Sun Prairie, Windsor, DeForest, now Cottage Grove, but also Middleton and Fitchburg have grown substantially. So based on this net new construction formula, we're able to raise our revenue citywide, um, and that's in this additional column. So about $100,000 a year is what we're able to raise our revenue by. And $100,000 a year um, on a $12, $13 million budget really doesn't even keep up with the cost of living. So we're trying to uh, make sure that we retain our employees and give them an appropriate raise or we feel that we need to add staffing and able to provide services because we have more people that are in need. Um, it really makes it a challenge for us. So what we try to do to offset that is use technology, um, 
do some uh, restructuring to create uh, efficiencies in our employees, um, buy equipment. Um, so maybe instead of having two people in a truck, maybe one person can drive that truck and operate. Uh, example of that would be our leaf sucking machines. We used to have a truck where it took one to drive and one to suck the leaves, and now we have a truck where the driver can do both at the same time. So we look for ways um, to create efficiencies and you know, and do the best we can with, with the people we have. We have a great um, employees here in the city of Stoughton, and we do ask a lot of them, and you know, they always deliver. So you know, and the storm was an example of that. Uh, this chart here is our student enrollment. So this goes back to the school year 2011. And back then, we had 3,314 students. And then this year, we have 2,727. So in the last 10 years, we basically are, we've lost 400 students in the school district. And this kind of breaks it down um, even more. And then why that is important is the way the school district's funding works is they take, the state of Wisconsin takes a three-year average of your enrollment and the state's portion of the school's revenue is based on that three-year average. So if your enrollment's going down, that means the money that the school district is from the state goes down, which puts it, the school district in a position where they can't, you know, they have the same challenges the city does, trying to make sure their employees are making a decent wage, uh, trying to make sure that they can uh, provide the services and the programming that the students want so they don't have to cut, you know, serve, uh, programs like strings or, or languages. Uh, so the school district, you know, the, periodically they're in a position where they have to go to a referendum in order to be able to continue to provide those services. And, um, you know, so they, they have challenges. So one of the things we want to do is we want to help the school district have more kids in the classroom because we know it's mutually beneficial having kid, more kids in our schools is go, good for the school district financially, provides opportunities for the students. It's good for the city because they have a healthy city. We need to have a healthy school district. And it's also good for our employers because they know that we're going to have more people coming to Stoughton to fill all the jobs. And we have a lot of jobs in Stoughton available right now. At Stoughton Trailers alone, they can hire 500 people right now. So here's some pictures of the developments that we're working on. This is the Kettle Park West one that I had mentioned before. And the yellow ones, um, these are all single family homes. And these are going to be the most affordable ones. They're on smaller lots. They're, uh, they have a private alley. So if you're familiar with uh, Verdian Homes, it's similar to what they do, where their driveways are basically back to back in this alleyway. And then they're typically two-story buildings, three bedrooms, and like I said, originally they're hoping to be 275 to 300,000. I have the feeling they're probably going to be closer to 350 when it's all said and done with. I mean, it's just, but you know, that's just how it goes. And then um, some of these other developments are on bigger lots, so there'll be higher price points there. Um, the orange down here, these are duplexes. And then the green to the left here, that's our parkland. And one of the things with what we did is originally, these were mostly going to be apartments here. And when I became mayor, I said I would prefer to have single family homes because that's best for the school district and for the community. And we reworked the whole plan, did these single family homes. And then the other thing we did is originally the park was in the middle of where the houses are. We wanted to move the park out to take advantage of the natural terrain there and then make it so that park is expandable. So as they develop in future phases to the west, we can make the park bigger as well. And then we can also uh, use the woods that are there, like I said, the natural features, and just really have a better um, opportunities and a better trail system. 
the trail system is kind of the dotted black, and we want to make sure these trail mm -hmm. systems uh, connect to what we currently have, and that they'll connect to future trails as, as we continue to develop to the west. This one here is the 51 West project that I was describing earlier. Uh, the plan right now is to start on the east side, so that's where Eggleson's Woods is. And what we try to do there is we try to use the parkland as kind of a buffer area, and then the stormwater ponds are in the blue. So the people that currently live and enjoy their peace and quiet in Eggleson's Woods will know that they'll always have that because we'll have the, the pond and the parkland there to preserve that. The yellow is a trail, and that trail will connect to the existing trail and the Virgin Lake Trail. And then going to the north, it will connect to the future development that we anticipate on the Linaroo property. The orange are the duplexes on the east side, and the brown are the apartments. And we expect this east side to start this year yet. Uh, one of the things we've been working on with the DOT is the intersection here. What we want to do is we want to extend Nygaard Street kind of behind uh, Taco Bell all the way up to this field here and then going to the west here we would put in a road and we'll eventually have a roundabout at this intersection here. We already have traffic safety concerns here and we think that having a four-way with the roundabout will be the most cost-effective and safe solution here. When you get to the west side this red area is zone for commercial, so it could be one big building or it could be multiple buildings. Um, and then the brown are the multi-unit. I believe the one to the north here is going to be the workforce one, but I'm not 100% sure about that. And then we have the orange are either duplexes or fourplexes. And then the yellow is a row of single family homes here. And once again, we tried to design it with the trails and the roads. Um, where we'd be able to expand them. The next one is a concept plan, and this is on a property that we call um, the Tigan Farm. So this is south of Stoughton. If you go down past the library, Fourth uh, Street, eventually when you get to the township, turns into Ocker Road and Taylor Lane. Uh, there's a utility substation down there, so if you've been down there, you might be familiar with that. And this is uh, the builder that purchased all the lots in uh, Nordic Ridge, has this concept plan here where we would be building single family homes and duplexes here. And then you can see the park here where we're trying to take advantage of the wetland that is there. There's some trees along here as well to have a parkland with some character. And then we, we're hoping that these homes here will be around 300000 as well. We'll see how that plays out. But that's the goal of this developer is to have, you know, homes that people can afford so they can, you know, raise their families there and, and provide uh, students for a school district. This is another development that we're still in the concept phase, and this is down off a of racetrack road, uh, kind of on the back side uh, near Stoughton Trailers. Um, and then eventually it would extend all the way up to Highway 51, kind of where the Stone Airport is there. Um, so that's what this one is. This one would be done in phases, and this triangle phase would probably be the first phase. And what they'd like to do is they'd like to do some condos there. So they're in the process of doing their cost analysis to see what it'll cost for them to put in the infrastructure. When we go through these processes, there's many steps that we have to take. We typically have to make sure, number one, it's annexed in the city. Some of these are, some of them are not. Go through that process. Then we have what we call an urban service area amendment. And what that is, is the developer has to put together a stormwater plan, and that plan needs to be submitted um, for the developer by the city. And we submit that to the Capital Area Regional Planning Commission, which is called CARPC. And what they're looking for is they're looking for a stormwater plan these days that will accommodate up to a 200-year flood. And so all the engineers get together and they decide how they need to design this for their retention ponds and for drainage to make sure that when these houses are built, they don't get flooded out, flooded out someday. And they've been increasingly changing the standards over the years. It used to be 50-year flood, then 100. Now we're up to 200-year flood. 
um, in anticipation of, of you know weather related to climate change. So that's what this one here is, and usually then the other steps that are involved is you know the the platting, which really just really figures out how the lots are shaped and sized to make sure they meet all of our zoning requirements for setbacks. Um, so we go through the planning process, we go through the zoning process um, to make sure they're zoned appropriately for what they're going to build. So all these things, you know, take a lot of time and energy and there's many people that work on this stuff. Our planning department, our engineers, our city attorneys, the developers and their teams, we all work together to make these things happen. Um, it can be a long process. Uh, the other slide, I can't even see this. Uh, for some of the projects, we I mentioned the tax incremental financing, and what that is is that's a tool that became uh, available in the state law several years ago. And initially, it was used in redevelopment areas where you have that high cost of cleaning up the contamination. So what happens in a TIF is basically we take an area and we say we want to make this the tax incremental financing area because we know there's going to be a lot of expenses. Um, that are going to occur in a redevelopment area. A lot of the expense is tearing down old buildings and getting rid of the contamination, so the site's ready to put up a new building. So what happens is, is somebody takes out a loan. Uh, it could be the city, it could be the developer, depending on what kind of a TIF district it is. So, for example, on the, the riverfront project, the city's basically accumulated three million dollars worth of debt by purchasing, removing buildings, and cleaning up contamination. So we have to pay that debt back. And the way it's paid back is through the property tax from the new buildings that go up. So normally when a building is built, the property taxes are split up amongst all the taxing authorities, the city, the school district, Dane County, and Madison College. In a TIF district, what happens is that tax money all goes back to the city or the developer, depending on who's financing the loan, all that property tax goes back to that entity until that loan is paid off. And depending on what kind of a district it is, um, that could be 20 years or it could be 27 years. Usually in a redevelopment area like on the riverfront, that's a 27-year loan. In a new development like out on 51 West, that's a, what they call a greenfield loan. Um, that one is typically a 20-year loan. So what we do is we work with the developers and we determine how we're going to go about to finance this thing um, to encourage growth. So that's really one of the tools that uh, the state put into place several years ago. And this chart here kind of shows how it works. And basically, um, in, the, in the state last year, there were 89 new TIF districts TIF developments in 44, so about half of them were what we call mixed use. Mixed use are typically the greenfield developments like 51 West where there's some commercial and some residential. And it looks like uh, most of the other half were in these redevelopment or blighted areas. So that's what we kind of the trend that we've seen. Are there any questions about any of that? I know it's like a lot of information. How about your canoe thing? So one of the other projects we've been working on on the riverfront development is uh, improvements on the river and Mant Park. So there's actually three projects going on. The one with the with the uh, development. Yeah, I don't know if I have a map on that. <coughs> There's one with, with the new apartments that are going to go on in the de development. I don't have it on this one. And then there's one uh, for the actual park. And then there's another one for what we're calling the water park. And the water park, they've been working on that since before I became mayor. So about five, six years ago, they've been working on that. And what that is, is we've been working with the DNR, with an engineer. Um, with wildlife biologists, uh, water experts, to figure out you know how we can design uh, a park on the river. 
and the way they typically work is right now we have a dam down there and we were going to design this water park feature where you put in basically boulders and it creates a ripple so if you're on a kayak or a canoe or a tube you can go through the ripples and everybody has a good time. Um, so initially they were going to design this water park to, um, to, to basically go around the dam. Um, but there was some concern that um, the people wouldn't pay attention and it happened where somebody currently, the way it is, got too close to the dam and uh, got sucked through it. We were lucky that they weren't killed. So the, we established a committee uh, to study this project and they've had over 40 meetings, this committee, and they determined that we should look at an option to take the dam out in order to accommodate this and make this a safe uh, way for people to kayak or to. So in the process of that, we discovered that if we took the dam out and we actually received a grant to do that, um, to pay for it, but the grant said if you take the dam out, you can't put anything back in. And what we discovered is, is by just simply taking the dam out, the water level is going to drop five feet at the dam. So we had a lot of feedback, especially from people upstream, that it was going to impact the, the depth and the width of the river. Uh, so we asked the engineers to go back and redesign it. They did that. So on the third design came back and we went through multiple meetings. Uh, we went through, uh, we had people before COVID, we had 300 people at the Opera House one night. We had another 100 at the high school. We met with township residents to try to address their concerns. Um, we've had over 135 meetings on this topic, one way, shape, or form. Um, after gathering all the feedback and looking at the design, the committee decided to recommend that we go with the third design. The third design uh, would drop the water level two feet instead of five feet at the dam. And then as you go upstream, the water level um, drop off isn't as significant. So by the time you get all the way up by Highway B, uh, in the area up there they call the bay, under the normal water flow conditions in the summertime, the water level might drop an inch or two. And what we did is, based on the concerns, we had an engineer come out and do a water flow um, measurements. They sent them to the engineers, they put that information in their data, and that's how they come up with that information. So the plan has been to, uh, was approved by the City Council on August 24th of last year on a 10 to 1 vote to move ahead with the third design. Um, we're still applying for grants to try to keep the cost down. So far between the riverfront development and the water park, um, the, the water park uh, upgrade here, we've secured about $2 million worth of grants. We believe that the end cost to the taxpayers will be less than $2 million. Uh, we're still applying for more grants. There's some impact fees that are collected from the developer that would normally go toward park equipment. They're not going to have park equipment over on this other side of the river here. So we can possibly use those fees to offset um, the cost of doing this work. Um, we're planning on putting a bridge across the river yet this year and doing some uh, riverbank work and some stormwater work on the developer side once we get the clearing from the DNR on the contamination. And then next year we would start the process of what they would call the dam reconstruction. So when they did the third design, the difference between the second design and the third design was with the second design they were taking the dam, the whole entire structure out. And like I said, it was going to drop the water level five feet. And since they said we couldn't put anything back in, which would be these rocks that create the ripple, because by the definition of the DNR, those rocks were going to hold back water similar to a dam. So by their definition, even though it didn't look or quack or smell like a dam, and by their definition it was a dam. So under the third design, um, 
instead of taking the entire dam structure out, there's a cement base that's in the river, and that cement base would be left in there. So therefore, when we design the dam to make sure that it'll provide flood control for the 100-year flood, they can measure from the top of that cement base instead of the bottom of the river, and that's how we gain that additional three feet. Hopefully you followed all that. Where does the water come from originally for the river? A lot of the river, the river goes all the way up to the Madison Lakes. Okay. So oftentimes what happens, like this year we had a drought, so what would happen is, is um, when we have a drought in the Madison Lakes, the water level drops, right? Um, and so what they do is the Madison property owners, and a lot of that is expensive property on the lake, and they want to go out to their pier and their boats and everything. So what they do is they shut off the, the dam gate upstream at uh, La Falla Park, okay. and then there's one at Babcock Park in McFarland. So all the really control of the water is done upstream, not downstream. Um, the only thing our river does control is some of the low water flow because the water will pool there, but that's also what's causing the stagnation in the water. And we believe, based on the experts' testimony, that by removing the dam, the water temperature is going to drop, the quality of the water and the ecosystem is going to be way better because of uh, the lower temperature. If you you probably haven't seen the pictures of the summertime here if you haven't been here. Um, the water just gets green all the way up. Yeah, so we're hoping, well the plan would be is to get more flow down here and with that and a lower water temperature that the water will be cleaner. Um, and the other part of the project would be is there's what we call the mill pond. So this dam was built, this is actually not the original dam, so it's not historic in nature. The dam was built back in the day when they built the wooden wagons down at the site where we were doing the redevelopment and it, they had a sawmill down there. So they generated electricity for the sawmill. And about 13 years ago, we did do some repairs to the dam. To the, to the dam. Uh, it was like 500 and some thousand dollars worth of repairs. And at that point, they were planning on um, generating electricity again at the powerhouse. They never did a feasibility study and they determined later it wasn't cost effective to do it. So um, here we are, you know, years later we have an opportunity, the DNR, the Dean County, um, everybody's telling you this is the best thing that you can do for the river and we think that being able to put in these rocks and creating this water feature will actually attract people to come to Stoughton, uh, spend their money in our downtown businesses. Hopefully, people will consider moving here. Um, so that's kind of what's going on with that project. Um, we anticipate it'll be, um, you know, starting in full earnest next year if everything goes according to plan. There was actually a meeting yesterday with about 15 people, and people were engineers, um, several people from the DNR, and then also the Army Corps of Engineers because anything we do down there has to be approved by the DNR and the Army Corps of Engineers. So they're, they're working through their processes and trying to make sure that everybody is in agreement that the design is, is uh, doable and it meets all the requirements and expectations before we move forward with the plan. I see a lot of people with kayaks. A lot of people are buying them. Using. Yeah, I think one of the things we've noticed with COVID is that people are, you know, had to do more outdoor activities, so they were sick of being in the house. And uh, the kayaking is, in particular, has become really popular. And uh, you know, it's it's a healthy thing for families to do do together, which I would I would really encourage instead of like my grandchildren being on their. Uh, Video games. <laughs> I'd rather have them out doing something. My sister lives in Wausau. Yeah. Riverwalk. Oh. She's right behind. And how does that go? Well, they had it a year ago. They had to close it down, so there were no races, kayak races or anything. They did it for years. So they upgraded it and they put a park-like thing in with more modern. Um, 
equipment instead of your swing sets and stuff like that became more modern stuff. Really, really nice. And yeah, it's back working now. Oh, it's okay. really nice, pretty area. Nice. And that one's more of a competitive. That's the kayaking. Um, yeah. Thing they have. Yes. And ours will be more beginner and intermediate. We're looking at possibly doing what they call a surf wave, mm -hmm. which is really popular in Bend, Oregon, where people. They, they get out and they, they can surf on this thing yes. and they wipe out and the next guy comes out and they wipe out and they just do this all day long. Yeah. yeah, so it's similar to that. I, I, I was up in Wausau, it's been probably three years now. Mm -hmm. um, so I did have a chance to tour it and they have a really nice trail system. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we'll be doing here. And I mentioned that we'll have the bridge going across and then we'll have um, uh, little areas uh, where people can fish one of the other advantages of doing this is right now the fish can't get upstream to spawn because of the dam. So, you know, the fishing experts are telling us by removing the dam and, and doing this project, the fish will be upstream so the fishing will be better. Um, so there's all sorts of benefits to doing this. The downside is, is yeah, the water level and the width of the river will change. Um, and some people, you know, have a sentimental attachment to the dam change is really hard. I understand that, but change is necessary to move forward. So sometimes you just have to do what you think is best and, for the greater and good. And the water level may change on its own with the environment too, so you, right. you'll always have that to take into consideration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about anything today? I'm glad I brought it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's, it's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you can see we're busy uh, great. and our staff is working extremely hard and Cindy included, um, especially trying to get through COVID the last couple of years has been really, really difficult. But I think we've shown great resiliency in the city. We've actually, in some cases, become more efficient because of that, out of necessity. We still have a few people that, you know, work at home some people work better at home than they do in the office. I personally couldn't do it, but others, you know, they can get in there. There's no distractions. They can get their work done quicker. Um, you know, we're still doing virtual meetings, which, you know, cuts down on travel time and makes it more convenient for folks. So, you have a question? Yes, I was wondering, do you have any intentions of fixing West Milwaukee Street? Yes, that's scheduled for the summer. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so it's going to be kind of a messy out there. And then we're also doing three roundabouts this summer. Um, I was going to ask about this. Yeah, so the three roundabouts, the first one will be um, on Pole Avenue and Silverado, kind of by where the SWAC is there. And Cummins is on the left-hand side there. Summit. Yep, Summit is right there. Yeah. So that's the first one. The second one is where the stop signal is. Um, on 51 and 138. That one was always designed to be temporary. I would have preferred if they would have just left the light there, but you know, the mayor doesn't always get to tell people what to do and the DOT has their own agenda, but we, we pick and choose our battles. Um, the third one will be on Roby Road by Stoughton Lumber and the quick trip that's out there and that's a bad spot. So those are probably the two biggest projects, so the three roundabouts are the DOT project, and then that Milwaukee Street is a, is a main road. I was on it yesterday um, when we were looking at the storm damage, and it's a washboard out there. I take 51 yeah. instead of taking that to go to the library. Sure. It's rough. Yeah, it really is. So yeah, that one is, is a big project, and you know, we just keep, mm -hmm. we chip away. Our public works department, they have some software from the, from the Department of Transportation, and it's called a PACER rating. So what they do is every year they go out and they inspect all the roads, they put the information in the computer, and then they rate the roads, and when it goes from a one to 10, and when it starts getting to be around a four, we look at trying to get them replaced. Um, if there's enough money available to do that, because what we try to do is, is you know have a consistent mill rate for the property taxes. Um, if we were to try to fix every road that needed it, your property taxes would skyrocket. So we try to put together a five-year plan to do that. 
And then we also work with Stoughton Utilities because oftentimes when a road needs to be done, they might need to do utility work at the same time. So we don't want to put a new road in and have them come back two years later and dig it up to put utilities in. And that's kind of what happened on Milwaukee Street. I, I worked on uh, Williamson mm -hmm. and they tore up that whole road, but they did it all at once. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But it took um, six months or more. Yeah. It was very annoying. Yeah, so is it nice now? Yes. Yeah. But they had it, they had it upgraded like, water. It was like a girl. My relatives was coming in and all of that. That's sure. a few years ago now, but yeah, it, it took a while, but it really. And they had that new equipment that ground up. The road. Oh yeah. And then when they took it and they reused it, and that was something new that they hadn't done. So there is more technology that came into play with it too. Sure. And it's just a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Any other questions today? Well, you know my opinion on one thirty-eight and fifty-one. Yeah. No way, Jose. That's yeah. going to be a disaster. One of the they things, better, tell them they better have money to tear it back out and put it the way it is. <laughs> really? We're just glad they're doing something. One of the things they're going to do is we're going to be the first one in Wisconsin. Um, they're going to put in some additional lighting for pedestrian and bike safety in the roundabouts. And we've been bugging them about that for the last couple of years. And they actually found an example down in Florida where they did that. So we're going to be kind of the pilot for Wisconsin yeah. because so, one of our concerns is people on bicyclists yeah. and walking aren't comfortable crossing at roundabouts. They'd rather do it at a stoplight. So we'll see how that works out. They're going to put a stoplight on the roundabout? No, they're going to put flashing lights. There isn't a lot of walking traffic on one side, but the other they side. They better put a damn society. bridge up and over it. I could it. see there would be, yeah. Yeah, yeah that would be a problem. So yeah, it's you know, they're on a limited budget too. In the afternoon, it's going to be chaos. Yeah, no way. Well, we'll see. You know, these guys are supposed to be smarter and paid more than I am. So we'll oh, see how that's, it comes out. It, they're going to end up tearing it up. Yeah. Well, if they do, hopefully they'll be paying for it. Well, I mean, you got the guys with the big ass pickup trucks. And they're they're gonna say, hey, get away, you little guy, because I'm going in. You know. I have a question. How sure. long have they had the crosswalk signs, the lighted ones that you push a button in it? Oh, those are nice. How long um, have they had those We've had some of them have been here for several years, and we did add quite a few the last four years. Okay. So when they first put them in, they they usually apply for grants for them. And if they're successful, they put them in. So they had, I don't know, a couple of them. There's one up by Pick and Save was one of the first ones because somebody got run over and killed up there. Um, His traffic's going a little faster right. than 25. Yeah. So then when I became mayor, you know, my instruction was to our staff, if, if we need to put a pedestrian light, just buy it. You know, don't wait they're for good. the grant. If you get a grant, great. But if you don't, we need to buy it anyway because obviously if there's a need, we need to just get it to make sure that people are safe. The so we've done I, quite a few down here. Yeah, in the, last the reason few years I ask is because yesterday I was going down to the post office, but I was going to go into drive up, mm -hmm. and so I stopped to turn, and a man pushed the light, and the lights were flashing. But the cars never stopped. Yeah, that's and both sides nice. kept going, right. and he didn't know what to do, but he never stepped mm -hmm. off and onto the road either to let them know that he wanted to walk. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself. Don't you see the flashing lights and the sign that says crosswalk? Yeah. So meanwhile, it dissipated. The light stopped, and he waited until he could cross safely, and he just walked across the street. Yeah. But I stopped and waited for him to go, and hopefully that other. But because I was turning, nobody paid attention to me. So that's why I asked, how long have the lights been there? That particular one has only been there. This will be the the second second or third summer. So we'll it's put been that a while. One that one we yeah. put in during COVID, yeah. But I don't know why people, I mean, when lights are know. flashing, you need to understand there's something going on. Yeah, well, what I'll do is, now that it's warming okay. up, you know, yeah. there'll be more people walking, I'll talk to the police department, because they can 
it can issue a citation mm -hmm. for that because right. the pedestrians have the right away. That's kind of what my concern was because mm -hmm. yeah. they have the farmer's market that will start in right. the parking lot there, and that's a busy mm -hmm. corner, but people do use mm -hmm. that to cross at that time. But um, I, I didn't understand, you know, why people weren't stopping. Uh, yeah, well, people are mm -hmm. just worried about themselves sometimes, mm -hmm. so it's unfortunate. Yeah, Any other questions? No comments. Oh. Lake Kaganza Road. Yeah. Uh -huh. On 138. Mm -hmm. It's it's tough. Oh, you gotta yeah, talk to the township. But yeah, I can do that. I'll drive out there and take a look at it. I mean, it is kind of an anxious historic. Well, I mean, the traffic has just gotten. Yeah. You need almost need a four lane now away from Oregon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On yeah, it's busy, but there again, you know, well, I you can tell the DOT what they do is they do a traffic impact analysis. Yeah. And in fact, out on the one development that development on 51 West, they did that out there, and we actually cannot the area red there where I showed you the commercial property. Um, they won't be able to develop that probably until 2026 because we have to have that intersection in there with that roundabout because of the traffic impact analysis. So the DOT does monitor the amount of traffic and based on their standards, when they hit that threshold, that's when they'll consider it. But sometimes it feels like their standards aren't really where they should be. Are you going to have a roundabout um, brought one done or comes down to 51? Yeah, yeah. I have a roundabout there. Yeah, in 2026 is the plan, and then they're going to have one, I think, in 2024, if I remember right, on Highway B. Mm -hmm. Which B? Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, by where the bank that was. Isn't, well, that isn't a bank anymore, is it? No, it's the yeah. Stone Health. Yeah, that's that. And then they would do another one, you know, where Highway A B is. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to put a roundabout there too. Has it helped lowering the speed limit there before the highway? I think it does, but there again, you've always got people that... Like I, I said, what's going to happen is all the traffic is going to go over 14. They're going to all come over and visit you. I mean, they're going to go right down. Yeah. Instead of going through roundabout, roundabout, roundabout. Yeah. Well, then they'll have to address it. So A lot of our people, they come to us to get to the east side, but it'll be easier to take it right on in on 14. Sure. Yeah. And hit the belt line and then cut over. Well, thanks for coming out today. Yeah. I appreciate well, you being thanks. here. Hopefully you learned a few things. I know I did. So yeah. well, I, we'll do it again sometime in a month from now. <laughs> and then I think the month after that, there'll be somebody here from Stoughton Health in the chamber in the school district. We've been doing that quarterly. So that's always a good one because then you get to talk to more people than just me. So thanks again for being here and hopefully I'll see you next month.